Good evening and welcome back, Poetry Love Buzz. It is I, ZM Wise, and here I am with Miss Jane Weninger, and she's going to talk about her work and her involvement in the poetry community. But uh, first, Jane, tell us, um, give us a, a bit of an overview on your work and what influences it. Uh, I think combined, love of God and love of fun. I an ordained minister, and I don't see that anything tells me I need to be a wet blanket, so I really enjoy my life. And I know that a lot of people are hurting, and I believe that faith will give them a strength to take the steps they need to get to a better place where they can be happy and enjoy themselves. That's absolutely beautiful. I love it. Um, so, for you as an individual, how does your faith and uh, being an ordained minister and your written work, how do they tie in together? Well, for while I was actually active in a church, I would say that I would spent at least 20 hours a week writing sermons. That was because I felt like I needed to respect those who came enough not to waste their time. So I did that. I also had to do a lot of business stuff, you know, that pertained to the church. Mm -hmm. um, as far as after I retired, I wanted to start meeting people who were not necessarily church involved, as well as church people. And so I started going to groups, and one of the groups I went to was a critique group. And I really, really liked the people there. And after a while, I felt very guilty that I was the only one who never had anything to offer. <laughs> so I started writing little snippets of poetry, and that's when I discovered I had talent. And so I did more. Uh, now I tend to write short shorts or poetry most of the time. I still do a sermon now and then. That's wonderful. That's brilliant. What is your writing process like? Well... I really like enjoying my life, so I am not one who will chisel out a certain amount of time every day to write, come no matter what, no matter what. <laughs> uh, to me, that's a big fat drag. <laughs> so, I basically, frequently in the morning, when I open my eyes, I will get an idea. And it will start coming to me in phrases, or sometimes in the middle of the night, even. And if that happens, I just get up and write it down. And then I go back to sleep or go make coffee or whatever the day's bringing. I get back to it, polish it up, get back to it, polish it up. And I always take it, well, I don't know, always, but almost always take it to some critique group because I find they really make it work better. <laughs> right. So, and they're hard to take. Um, for me, Way back before I got involved this time in writing, before I came down to Texas, I was going to a critique group, and at that time I had a little, maybe a lot, too much ego, <laughs> and I got involved in a critique group, and they were awesome also. I loved them, uh, but I had to learn to take criticism, keep them out shut, and I, I found it helped me a whole lot. So it's, a, it's a good skill. <laughs> yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Now, there, uh, in, depending on the critique group, I've also noticed that there are certain individuals, um, they don't quite know the difference between constructive criticism, is, which is what we all need to take, and then harsh criticism. And those are often the comments that you shouldn't listen to at all. It's recommended, in fact, that you don't listen to them because they don't have anything to back those comments up. It's ju they're just empty words like oh this this piece is awful or they're n they're not offering any helpful suggestions they're not asking you have you thought of altering this to this I like what you've done here that you know that's constructive criticism you know and I assume that that's what you've been learning to to take and whatnot I mean, and it, and it can be very helpful in our futures as uh, written creators and whatnot mm -hmm. definitely. Um. And your question to me was? Well, I mean, have you I mean, have you found that it's mostly been constructive, or have you received a few harsh comments as well? Oh, I've received a few harsh comments, but mm -hmm. like I said, that was part of my spiritual growth. You know, <laughs> learn to ignore it and not hit back. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's, that's it. Um, most of them have been constructive. Uh, I 
also lead a couple of critique groups. And my rule is no matter what they say, don't internalize it, have them write it down. And then go home, and if it smarts, put it on the desk for a couple of days. Then go back to it and throw away everything that makes no sense to it. And then whatever does seem to help, see what you can do with it. Wonderful. I like that. I like that very much. Could you give us a brief overview of both of the books that you brought with you today? Okay. Well, I have three books, actually. One is not here. Okay. One's a history book, which... Um, is about how a huge multi-level care facility for elderly people grew out of a poor farm in Massachusetts, central Massachusetts. And uh, it's called Do Much Honor, H-O-N-O-U-R. Mm. It's currently out of print. I probably would like to undo that at some point. But I would call it the definitive work on that particular subject because I was privileged to go all the way back to the 1700s when I actually had a hard time reading the words because the letters were shaped differently right. and, and get my information from the original documents mm -hmm. and watch its progress from something that was almost a shack to something a little bigger, a little better. Uh, then there was a big um, plague in Central Mass, and the people who were at the poor farm were sent out to clean up the garbage because they thought that the bacteria would um, multiply, and that's how the plague was being spread. And um, because they had so much garbage, they started feeding it to the animals and using it to compost, compost uh, the place. And it was called a poor farm, not because it was for the poor, but because the dirt was so poor. <laughs> and it ended up being closed down for competing with business because their produce was so great. <laughs> you know? And so I'm really proud of that work. My other one, the second one was Body and Soul. And B-A-W-D-Y is not a misprint. <laughs> uh, and it's for the reason I said before. I don't think God wants us miserable and serious all the time. But I think his grace is real, and the ability to be happy is real, and there's some of both of those in here. Wonderful. And this here is an absolutely religious book. This is uh, Love, Spirit, Power, and Peace, and basically it's meditations. Hmm. And I used it to accompany a course I gave, and then I decided that it would maybe help somebody just reading a piece, thinking it over, reading a piece, thinking it over, so I put it into print. And I'm thrilled by what happened with this, because I actually have not sold copies to many people. I've mostly given away copies. Mm. But there was a gentleman who lost his wife, and they had been married a long time, and I'm thinking like 40 years, and they never learned to get along, and she died. Oh. And he was just lost. I don't know what else to say. Yeah. And he'd come to me now and then for spiritual counseling. So one day I gave him this, and I said, why don't you read one part a day? And just think about it. And then the next day I read another part. So he took it. A few months later, he's knocking on my door. And he put something in my hand, and he says, use this to write books and give them away so they'll help other people like they help me. So I had $100 in my hand. Wow. And I get these at cost. You're right. <laughs> So, uh, anyway, I did that, and a few weeks later, he knocks on my door again, and he put $80 in my hand, he says, do the same thing. And then if, about three weeks after that, he knocks on my door again, and he puts in 20 and he says, I counted wrong the last time. <laughs> you know, and he just showed up last week, gave me about 100 to buy books. Beautiful. So, I can, I can afford to give him away. Right, definitely. <laughs> Well, Jane, uh, before we conclude, would you like to uh, share a piece with us? Yeah. I would say, however, that these two are available on Amazon and mm. other places. Good to know. That's all I need to say. And if anybody buys one, I wouldn't mind, really. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you want me to read something. Here we go. First one. If I can get the pages. Old Roommates. 
Joey's got a girlfriend, an old man taunts from his bed. Do not, Joe retorts. Joey's got a girlfriend, Joey's got a girlfriend. Do not, do not, Joey's got a girlfriend. Joe jumps off his bed and tackles him. They drop off the side and roll over each other twice. Once, twice. When you're 80-something and fall to the floor in a fight, if the thud doesn't break your bones, it does pluck the power from your punch. So, Joseph has a girlfriend, and his roommate keeps his lips zipped, even if he is jealous. <laughs> okay. And I think I'm changing my mind about the one I was going to read, and uh -huh. I'm going to try this one instead. The highest jumper shares the gold, and it's about Jesus. His first bar was set. The trip to Jerusalem... He hopped over the devil's head, ignoring his prompting for an opposite course, stay out of harm's way. He cleared the second bar, getting up after succumbing to the weight of the wood. He jumped over the raised again bar after flopping under the wood weight one more time, but he slogged forward. He hurled himself over a higher bar, pushing onward. Those so weak soldiers conscripted him a helper to defy death's preempting his final torture. He leaped to a higher height, laid himself on a hungry cross. The system nailed him down. Mm. He passed over another mark, refusing to commandeer his army of angels who would have denied him his destiny. He leaped higher still after they raised that rough cross, groaning out his last grand birth. The ecstatic, sexy demon leapt to the crown of the cross, gleefully hopping over the vaulter's head, back and forth, back and forth on the burly beam. Satan sang. He doubled over laughing. He rolled over his hips and kicked his legs high and did his dirty, diabolical victory dance because <coughs> this man would never breathe again. But when Jesus cleared his den-end objective, he had hurled himself over his highest bar. Not satisfied with a gold medal, he won everything that's worth having. He jumped the highest high jump on the planet and launched himself into heaven with us on his back. Mm. The father, exuberant, jubilant, reveled so blatantly in his son's success that neither could pinion their vitality. And Sunday came. Jesus sprung forth, walked and talked, loved and ate, and still lives, triumphant, powerful, accessible, and generous. He wins. With him, we win. Mm. And that's them. Wonderful. Thank you very much for taking the time to be with us today, Jane. And uh, all of you poetry lovers out there, you can find her work on Amazon. And uh, stop by for a reading to, uh, to be a witness in her brilliant performance. Thank you very much. Poetry lives.